Take your Bibles this afternoon and let's go over to Matthew chapter 21, please. Matthew chapter 21. This afternoon I want to preach on our Goodly Man series, Stepping from Our Knees. One of the greatest needs we need is prayer. However, the subject of prayer has been the most written about, preached about, talked about, but sadly the least practiced activity in the lives of most Christian. You think about, it is a cliche to say, I'm praying for you. But you really think about this. Do you ever wonder sometimes if people really are, or if it's just something a normal Christian says? You know, I'll pray for you. And this is what the Lord really wants us to do, is truly pray. Um, Brother Bill Hiltz, he's with the Lord, but when you ask him to pray for something, he would stop right there and pray, no matter where you're at. Because he says, I'll forget. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, the thing is, he's honest. He says, if I don't pray for it now, I won't remember. And the older we get, we do. We, life gets evolved, life gets uh, complex, and our memory sometimes, we can't even remember where we put our watch and our shoes and anything else. And, but this is something important. When someone has a need on their heart, stop right there, pray with them. It's, it's not an inconvenience, it's an added bonus for each and every one that we thought and we remembered. But how do we develop a consistent prayer life? This is something that is, is a, it's a habit that has to be developed. For anything that we do, it has to be worked at. If you're going to learn a trade, you don't just go in and say, I'm going to apply to be an electrician. I'm sure Adrian knew how to put a wire together. Some people, I wonder if they know how to put a wire together. But, you know, he didn't walk in there and says, I know what I'm doing. He had to be tested. Anybody has to be tested. Uh, you think about everything, you know, I wasn't allowed to go into buildings and things like that as a firefighter until I qualified by the state of Georgia. It was a qualification. I had to get my certification first in order to do what I wanted to do and anything else. And this is where developing a Christian prayer life, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 21 and 22, the Bible says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you should not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. This is the confidence that we have in the Lord if our prayer life and our life is right, if we have faith in who God is and what God is capable of. And as it says, doubt not. That's the key. He says, pray and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And this is where t this afternoon I want to preach about the most powerful weapon we have in the church's arsenal, prayer. And how we can walk guided by grace, as the morning service is, or Sunday school is, and steps of a good man. If we step from our knees, think about there's not a far distance to fall if you're already on your knees. Amen? Amen. And that's where God wants us to fight from, is on our knees. Let's pray this afternoon. Heavenly Father, Lord, prayer is a powerful subject. It is a powerful tool, weapon against the devil's arsenals, against the world and the principalities of the air. Lord, we need this power. The power comes from the Holy Spirit in doing us from on high. Give us the consistency, give us the passion, give us the habit that we may use it and wield it for your honor and your glory. Lord, help it, me as I preach this message that you will allow it to be a blessing to those that hear. 
In Jesus' precious name, amen. When you think about prayer, God does not intend for prayer to be used only in emergency. It's not a lucky rabbit's foot. It's not a telephone to get us out of trouble. God, I'm in trouble. I need hair. Prayer. But you think about this. It really is a crutch in the Christian life. It is a crutch that people use only when they're hurt. It ought to be a crutch used all the time to lean on God. But people only pull it out of the closet. I know, I know the crutch is in her somewhere. Oh, here it is. I need prayer today. We need prayer every day. We need to talk to God every day. It's no different if we never talk to our parents, if we never talk to our kids, but only when we needed them. How would your husband, how would your wife, how would your kids, how would anybody feel? Is if they never heard from you unless they needed something. What would your response when the phone rang? Oh, April's calling. <laughs> she wants something again. <laughs> you know, oh, mom's calling. I'll talk to her later. <laughs> you know, but it's like, you think about this. If we would do that, we're like, oh no. What kind of relationship would we have with our children, with our parents, with anybody? Oh, this. How do you think God feels? Oh, my child's calling. Yep, they're hurt again. You know, oh, they're broke. They're this, they're that. So now they're going to call on me. But the rest of the time, they're hunky dory. They don't need God. And so people don't understand in Christianity, prayer is not a crutch that we use when we need God. Prayer is a ability to communicate to God daily and talk to him as our friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Sadly, this is the way many Christians treat God. They go to Him in prayer when things are going bad or when they need something from Him. God desires from the very beginning to walk with us in the garden. He wants to talk to us. He wants to have that personal relationship with you that consists of continual communication. Not haphazard communication. But communication is both giving and receiving. Many people's prayer is, Lord, I need, 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 want, 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 give me this, 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 take care of this person, amen. But the problem with a communication that way, it's one-sided, amen? amen? They're not waiting for God to talk to them. They get up before. One of the perfect examples of God talking to man and man talking to God is found in Genesis 18 where God is walking and talking with Abraham and Abraham looks to him and says, God, there's a city down here that's wicked. Its name is Sodom and Gomorrah. But would you spare it for 45 people? God, yes. Abraham says, great. Would you spare it for 40 people? Yes. And he goes down the line. But you know what he kept saying? Be not angry with me. But I have one more request. Would you spare it for five? God is shown in the scripture talking back and forth with Abraham and Abraham with a boldness to say, be not angry with me, but would you do it for this? And you know the sad thing is? There were not five righteous people found in the city. But this is the only chapter and verses in the scripture that God is shown leaving man after the conversation is done. Would you not prefer a conversation where God is finished talking to you and leaves? instead of us finish talking to God and we leave Him without an answer. That's the way we need to realize it's no different than leaving the home with something unsaid. You always have that emptiness. We go to church and we hear from God all the time, but we don't find it important to talk to God. As Christians, we have become lazy. One particular man in the Bible was a great example of the area of consistent prayer life, and his name is Daniel. The Bible says in Daniel 6, turn with me there, Daniel 6. Daniel 6. And 
and verse 7. All the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statue and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now look over in verse 9. And wherefore the king Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to his house and his windows being opened in his chambers toward Jerusalem. He kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He was a consistent clockwork Christian. You could set his clock by Daniel. Three times a day he knelt and prayed to God for Jerusalem, or toward Jerusalem, excuse me, and as the Bible says here, gave thanks. He didn't go in another part of his room. Did you notice that? He didn't go hide. He went right before the open window, and the Bible says in verse 11, And these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They knew right where to look. We need to be that consistent, and, and three times a day does not mean praying for your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It means more than that. Yes, give thanks to God because He provided us, even when we had little, He's provided us food. But praying is, as the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. It's a constant state of prayer. Pray as you're driving. Pray as you're working. Pray as you're in the bathtub. Pray as you're shaving. Pray, it doesn't matter what we're doing, pray. We don't necessarily have to talk out loud for God to hear us. Pray while you're washing dishes. Pray while you're vacuuming. Pray while you're mowing lawn. Pray while you're gardening. Pray and constantly pray. Build that communication to where you know you have an open line of receiving and giving of prayers. If we are to walk in the steps of the Lord, we got to talk to Him. How do we know the steps of the Lord? Yes, we got the Word, but if we've got sin in our life, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? If we regard iniquity in our heart, he will not hear us. So we're praying, but he's not listening. And this is the thing is, the Bible tells us that he prayed three times daily. Well, how did he get there? If we go back to Daniel chapters 1, he purposed in his heart to not defile himself with the king's meat. This was a lifelong habit he developed, and nothing was going to break it. It's easy it seems to break our Christian habits. You say, well, I, I don't have too much time to pray. Or do we not make too much time to pray? Three times a day, Daniel set aside to pray to God. I believe these were times when Daniel told God everything that was going to go on. And then ask God for wisdom and discernment to make the right choices. Daniel was one of the presidents in Babylon. He recognized that he needs God's help in making decisions. Instead of seeking worldly advice, he sought God's advice. James tells us in chapter 1, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth, a, giveth to all men liberally, and unabradeth not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. The Bible does not say what Daniel prayed about. doesn't matter. You know what prayer is? Your communication with God. Amen. People say, well, just no different than the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. You know what he did? And the Lord's prayer is not where he taught them. The Lord's prayer where he really taught them to pray, that was found in John 17. But you know what something is interesting? During that time, the very next chapter, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and they didn't hear God's true prayer. They fell asleep. Or they would have heard, Father, let this cup pass from me. They would have heard Jesus 
one of them with him, praying with him. Why? There's more power where two or three are gathered together. He wanted the power. He needed the encouragement. He didn't want the verbal. He wanted the spiritual. And that's why he says, just go sleep. He was trying to get them to see that it wasn't just, he didn't bring the three with him just to have the moral support. He wanted the spiritual support. He wanted the praying and the compadreship or the comradeship and having them pray with him, but they were too tired. James, that's why he tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that given to all men liberally. It is obvious that Daniel's prayer was not altered by the circumstances and the threat of death. If Christians would place this kind of importance on prayer, we would have fewer problems in our homes, in our churches, and our communities as a result. Mary, Queen of Scots, told her council that if there is only one man and out of all of Scotland, she fears. And that is the prayers of John Knox. She was afraid of that man. You think about others that brought that consistent prayer. It did not happen for John Knox, who was not a believer for most of his life. It was developed. Praying Hyde, John Hyde, was not... Born with the gift of prayer, he developed the prayer. It takes work. You won't just wake up one morning after you get saved and decided, hey, I'm going to be a prayer warrior. I'm going to learn to pray and talk to God. I think I'll pray for an hour this morning. Really? Great. Let me see how many interruptions you have. Phone rings, dog and cat, husband, wife, children problems, it's going to happen. Why? The devil's going to make sure you don't pray for an hour. How are you going to build a habit that no matter what happens, you're going to be consistent in prayer? So this is where it has to be developed. Well, the phone rings. My mom used to go unplug it from the wall. Can't do that much anymore. But she unplugged it to the wall when she prayed. My grandmother did the same thing. She didn't allow because people were calling her all the time to ask her to pray requests. She goes, I have to pray first. If you're continuing to ask me requests, I don't have time to pray. So there was a time where her phone was unplugged. You couldn't get a hold of her. She was on that lazy boy praying to the Lord. We've got to think about this. We've got to make that choices. Okay, let's remove the distractions from our room. That's why the Bible says go into your closet. There's not much but clothes hanging there. You know, there's no distractions in the closet. And this is where we, a consistent prayer life, needs to happen, but does not happen overnight. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Every day, you're going to have to make a choice to get up, to set a time to read. How does God talk to you? Through His Word. How do you talk to God? Through prayer. And people say, well, God talks to me. He doesn't talk to you apart from God's word. You may feel an impression. You may feel this. But you know where you get your confirmation? In the word. The devil's good at impressing. Hey, the devil can put things in your mind. He can put things in your heart. He can give. We have seen it in communities ministry. We've seen it outside of communities ministry. I've been in, around churches all my life. I've seen people say, well, the Lord's leading me. And I've heard my pastor say, what's the scripture he's gave me? Oh, I was just impressed. You know how God called me here? By scripture. You know how my God, God called my wife here? By scripture. Were you impressed? Absolutely. There was no doubt about it when I drove through this region. I felt like this is where I need to be. However, God also confirmed it. See, he leads by impression, but he also leads by confirmation. If you don't have a verse, and don't pull one out of the hat, because you can find many verses that confirm what you want to do. 
And I've had people do that. Well, pastor, I think I went, oh, there's a verse. <laughs> this works for me. And you're like, wow, that was right. I, mm -hmm. But see, this is a problem. We can always confirm our own will. The problem is our will is not God's will. And this is where the Bible says, I die daily. Each day we choose either to die to self or live for ourselves. Paul was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. Yet he struggled daily. The only way Paul was able to live victorious was to crucify his flesh daily, seeking God's wisdom in every decision. God created and controls everything. He wants you and I to come to Him in prayer with even the smallest of little detail. He said, cast all your cares. Cares is many things. It could be you're facing a dental bill. Could face a heart bill. Could face groceries. You may just have to say something that's on your heart and you want to make sure it comes out right. It, it could be anything. It could be, Lord, lead me that I honor you all day long. There, there are so many things and God doesn't care. God doesn't say, I only want you to pray for him when you're buying a house. I only want you to pray when you're buying a car. Something big ticket, then you can talk to me. No, he doesn't care. You know, say, Lord, lead me to some good deals and groceries today. Lord, lead me to someone who needs to hear about the Lord. Lord, there's some things, you know, I'm, I'm just a little achy today, Lord. Can you help me feel better? He may or may not, but talk to him. He says, his fa your father in heaven cares for you. And this is something that if we are going to, if we already know that he has ordered the steps of a good man, he already knows the direction we need to take. Daniel prayed three times a day. It was important for him to, to get on his knees. When you think about, you might say we have surrendered our life, but surrendered life is a molded life to him. There's only two choices Dr. Getz says on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self, what will we choose today? Here are some recommendations this afternoon that I hope that will help you develop a consistent prayer time. In order to have a consistent prayer time, you must have a time. You must plan a time. Everybody knows breakfast. Everybody's different. Some are seven, some are six, some are eight, 8.30. My family's house, not, not this one, my dad's house, eight o'clock, breakfast. 12 o'clock, lunch. Five o'clock, supper. It was clockwork. And I could still hear dad. Breakfast ready yet? He wanted to get his day going. And after breakfast, there was no question before anyone ever got up. We had devotions and prayer. No one left the table. Breakfast was not done until we had a time of prayer and a short devotion. It was a habit to this day. My dad, 92, and my mother, 90, will sit down at breakfast and they will have daily bread, Baptist bread, whatever, one of those booklets by their thing with the Bible. They'll read it and they'll pray. They're not starting their day as a family. And even now, all these years, this is something, a developed time. And it's habit. Is there going to be chaos? Absolutely. Is there going to be change of habit? Yes. But are we flexible to change that time with God and not just cancel the time with God? If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Schedule a time for prayer. Schedule a time. Notice in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Look what it said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is God Himself. His relationship with His Father was very important. In Mark 1, 35, the Bible says, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And there prayed. 
it was important for our Lord to get up while it was still dark and get with God. You know what's the best time about early mornings? Telemarketers are not awake. Most of the time, kids are not awake. Husband or wife's not awake. And have you ever noticed, especially when you look out your window, the sun's not risen yet. You may see the darkness of the sky and the reflection of the street lights, but then you get to see the sunrise. It's just a time of peace. The house is quiet. Most of the time the pets are sound asleep too. There's really nothing. It's still. In the still of the night, the song says. Develop a habit. I know some people pray at night. Some people pray in the morning. Some people pray in the afternoons. It all depends on schedule. But I find in the mornings it's the best. Why? It's before my day starts. It's asking God direction. Other men were wise and established schedules. General Havelock, a famous general of old, arose every morning at four and spent two hours in prayer before leading his troops. Stonewall Jackson, the famous Confederate soldier, he was the first Confederate soldier to start a Sunday school at his church for black children. His favorite book was Joshua. What a godly man. Him and his wife would pour over scriptures day in, day out. Never owned a slave in a day of his life. But we had the privilege of visiting his church. That was the first church in Lexington, Virginia to have a Sunday school for black children. He had such a following. Blacks, former slaves, Slaves loved him because of the love. He loved to teach everybody to read from, the, guess where? The Bible. The man was mighty. But you know, as he said, I would do two things. He said, I could not begin to battle and begin to lead my men before I was led of God. How could we be led of God if we've never asked God to lead us? Sadly, he passed away as he was shot by his own men in mistaken identity. But you think about this. Here was a man that even in the midst of the war was concerned about the slave children, about those that were less fortunate and poor, that he wanted to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says, how can I lead my men if I have not been led of God? How can I lead? How can we lead? How can a mother lead her children? How can a father lead, her, lead his family? How can a father be directed if we are not led of God? We do that by prayer. We seem to find time for everything except prayer. And that reveals how small a priority it truly is. Plan a regular time for prayer for yourself. If the prayer closet alone and with your family... Make up a prayer list of specific needs you have and list the names of people you desire to uphold in prayer. If you live by a schedule, take time to schedule your prayer into your schedule. If you do not live by a schedule, set up reminders and make time just to stop and talk to God. You do not need to spend hours upon hours each time in prayer. It is not the quantity of time that changes you, but the quality of time. God would be pleased if you gave him 15 minutes quality time, more than an hour of quantity. There is a definite difference in quantity versus quality. Oh, you can pray a lot, but it doesn't mean God's hearing. He would rather you have a short amount of time where you really talk to him. Abraham's prayer was seven verses long, but what a powerful prayer. He was so concerned that he would not anger God. Please God by planning a time. If you don't have a time, say, Lord, 6 o'clock every morning, wake me up. Oh, he'll wake you up, I promise you. Let me and give me a clear mind. What a good prayer. David says, search me and try me, O Lord. 
That is a great why. And then it leads us into the next one, preparing for your prayer time. How do you prepare? You don't just get out of bed and go, okay, I'm going to start praying. Get in the Word. God talks to you through His Word. Say, God, help me if there is any sin in my heart. Search me and try me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, He will not hear us. It doesn't say that once. It says it twice in Isaiah and Psalms. So be mindful that we can have a spiritual blockage. We need that stent, amen? That clears up that blockage of the arteries so our heart works right. Search me and try me. When you start up an older car on a chilly morning, it usually sputters and coughs until it warms up. Likewise, in our prayer, we need to get warmed up and ready to pray. Robert McChaney says, A great part of my time is spent in getting my heart ready for prayer. We need to spend time making sure that our heart is teachable. It's able to hear and it's able to speak. We can prepare our prayer is by reading Psalms or other portions of scriptures. Read until you find yourself in the right frame of mind, getting rid of all the things of today that's in our mind and focus on Him. One of my professors, and I still have not owned this book yet. I have many books on prayer. And I've read many books from Charles Finney to Charles Spurgeon to Praying Hyde and E.M. Bounds. But I've yet to own this one. I own one book by him, Norman Grubbs. He is the son-in-law of C.T. Studd. And sadly, he was killed during World War II. He came back home to ask the Church of England, not the Church of England, but the Churches of England for more needs for Congo for his father-in-law. And he said, before we ask for any needs, we need to gather in this mission house and we need to pray and ask if our needs align with God's wants. And while they were praying, a V1 bomb fell on the house and all 17 preachers died that day. But he prayed, what a way to go to glory, amen? amen. Germans launched a V1 bomb from the shores of France and he went into eternity on his knees it took two months for the telegram and the letters to get back to his father-in-law that he would never be coming home I read the book and it just shook me to think about he chose to go back to England in the midst of a war for the needs of people in Africa and God used him and allowed him to be graduated to glory. But the book that he wrote a couple years before he passed away is one word, an assessor. And it said it's one of the most powerful books on prayer. It's called Intercessor. In it, he talks about the greatest necessity to prepare our hearts for a season of prayer. It challenges a Christian to wait on the Lord and meditate upon the Lord before bringing any requests to Him. Preparing for prayer is like preparing for worship. Many people just come to church. I've been guilty. We just, hey, it's Sunday, we're going to go to church. But we haven't prepared our heart to hear from God. We haven't prepared our heart to say, this is the Lord's day. I was laughing with uh, a Christian the other day and he goes it's sad but we come in to get out you, you think about this he says I remember the day he goes when people would come 20, 30, 40 minutes early and just fellowship he said the, 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 the front foyer would be filled with people just fellowshipping and then he said, do you remember the days when the lights would flash in the foyer to let us know to get into church? It's time to worship. And he goes, we'd all get in there, we'd worship. And right after the pastor said amen, everybody just stood in the auditorium and talked. And he says, 
Now it's, everybody is like two and a half seconds left before church starts. We roll in. We sit down. Three seconds after he says amen, we're all heading toward the back door. No one, and, it, and they're like, well, no one wants to get to know us. No one wants to, well, how can we get to know you when we're here, you're here, and everybody's here, and people are flying in right on time and flying in right after time? How do you get to know anybody? How do you fellowship? How do you encourage? And he goes, and we were talking about prayer. He said, I feel like my prayer sometimes, like, oh, it's prayer time. Lord, he said, I had no time to prepare myself. He says, when we do this, when we rush in there, we're trying to get our clothes, hair done, and we rush into church, our heart's so busy and muddled. We sit down and we're actually mentally looking at the clocks, going, is it 11.15 yet? Pastor's almost done. Okay, he's getting close. We're done. Okay, now we get to start a day and we get to do this. He goes, Sunday's just a day. He goes, wouldn't it be better just to stay home and not even bother worship if our heart is not ready to worship? Wouldn't it be ready just to forgo prayer if all we're doing is saying some words? This is something that we got to think. It's important because this is the time we prepare our hearts. We plan our time so that we can thirdly prevail in prayer. How can we prevail in prayer if we've never practiced? Practice makes perfect. Tomorrow I get to go to my dentist. She's practicing. She's doing a great job. But you know, she was laughing last time I met her. And she goes, you know, my first root canal and crown, I must have scared the guy half to death. She said, my drill was just a shaking. She goes, he was my first patient of trying to get the tooth ready for a, root, uh, a crown. She goes, I kept every three seconds... Did, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? She goes, I had no, in, I, no security. And when she did mine, she's a third year student. And you know what? You think she'd been doing it all her life. She did a great job. But here's the thing. Everybody has to learn somewhere. We're not going to prevail in prayer on our first time. But maybe genuineness will help us. We have a desire to learn. Real prayer is hard work. That's why I said pray without ceasing. Don't give up. It involves laboring. It involves travail. It involves a spiritual battle because the devil will not let you alone. Your mind will be assaulted immediately. You'll think of the dog, the cat, the neighbor, and the plants outside, the plants inside, you know, the fly that's flying around. Everything will distract you from prayer. But to get a hold of God, we must pray in faith, believing. Just as I read in Matthew chapter 21, we have to put faith to our prayers. We need to take to God at His word and claim His promises. D.L. Moody's book on prevailing prayer gives these basic elements of prayer. Do not begin a prayer without adoration. Going back to the Lord's model prayer, He said, Hallow be thy name. Give God the credit for who He is. You want to get somebody's attention? Praise them. You want to make your parents feel great? All parents have failed. But at least they tried. Praise them. Mom, Dad, you did a good job. You know, get somebody's ears. Confession. After we've done adoration... The Bible tells us that God also said, forgive us our trespasses. Confession. We're not going to get our prayers heard unless we confess our sins. But the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful to forgive us of all our sins. Confession is good for the soul. That's what exactly Psalm 51, read through Psalms 51. He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Here's three, if you want it, three model prayers of three godly men in the Old Testament. First of all, Ezra chapter 9. Ezra the priest is praying and he begins to pray that God would work in his heart first. And then work in the nation of Israel. Second one, Nehemiah chapter 9. 
Nehemiah prays, what a godly man. Once again, he asks God to forgive us his sins. And Daniel chapter 9, they're all nines. These are all books on revival prayers. And each of them, the people are gathered around, except for Daniel. He's still praying for his people who are captives. He doesn't look at himself as a captive. He looks at himself as a part of the captivity that he himself, see this is humility. He lumped himself in the same group of people that there are in the reason they are as slaves is because they turn their back on God. Ezra chapter 9 is powerful. Nehemiah chapter 9 is powerful. Confession, Psalms 51, tells us how important it is to restore the joy of our salvation. What about restitution? D.L. Moody says, a prayer cannot be attained without the desire of restitution for those that we've harmed. Restitution for those that we have harmed. Have we all said something? Have we all done something? This is something he says, it's part of forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. If we harbor in our heart, if we regard iniquity in our heart, if we're holding it dear, we're never going to get that prayer that we need. Deal Moody, these are books. If you want books on prayer, the prevailing prayer by him, Norman Grubb's Intercession, E.M. Bounds, Sidlow Baxter has books, E.M. Bounds is, has a huge book on prayer. Charles Finney has a book on prayer. Charles Spurgeon has a book on prayer. Hudson Taylor has a book on prayer. These are men of the bygone years that saw God do a mighty, mighty work because they realized they could not do anything apart from prayer. But there's nothing more powerful in prayer, as the Bible says, in everything give thanks. Thanksgiving, D.L. Moody says, is an essential part of our prayer, is being thankful for the least to the most. He also says, not only restitution, but forgiveness. Forgiveness is essentially important because the Bible says in the book of Matthew, if we know that a brother hath ought against us, lay our gifts on the altar, go make it right. Well, I didn't do it. He did it. That's how we look to the world today. We want to point the fingers. It's not finger pointing. We got to realize we have the most powerful weapon at our fingertips and it is verily used. Just like asking being filled with the Holy Spirit. These are things, you think about it, if we were truly yielded to the Holy Spirit, the prayer that we could utter. Just think about if we were so dedicated knowing that I want to spend time on my knees so that God can, this church would be unstoppable. I read a book years ago by Jim Cimbala, Fresh Wind, Fresh, Fresh Power. He was pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle and they have 24-7, their church never shuts. The amount of people that go in day and night and pray. It hasn't always been easy. His daughter left him. Him and his wife and went to the streets and lived the life of drug addict, prostitute, and many other things. As a pastor of this great church, he lost his daughter. No matter how many times he went down and wept with her to come back home, she wouldn't. But he said, you know what? It's only God. Him and his wife would go pray all times of night at the church with the church people. Any given time, there could be thousands of people praying. And he said, you know what made it interesting about prayer? Was you could tell it was real. Because right after that, people would leave. There was no time limit. People prayed as long or as short as they wanted. But he said, I would leave the sanctuary at 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, wherever, whenever I felt like God wanted me to pray, I would go and pray. He said, I'd come out of the church. And of course, there in Brooklyn, <laughs> not a nice place most of the time. 
He said, I'd walk out into the street and there was one of my members sitting on the curb talking to a homeless person, talking to a street person, talking to a prostitute, a drug addict, a businessman, and sharing about God. Prayer changes people, amen? amen. And he goes, Sunday morning, I would see my people bringing the streetless, the homeless, Hispanics, blacks, whites, didn't matter who. He says, God was for everybody. Bringing them up and saying, this person accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And they would give a testimony from the church and get baptized. He goes, we grew by praying. But he tells the story about years and years later. His daughter finally said, please don't come to me anymore. Just leave me alone. He said, we didn't give up praying. He goes, one day I'm sitting at breakfast and we're praying. The door opens and my daughter comes to my lap and falls down on her knees and says, Dad, forgive me. She's now married to a pastor. You know, don't stop praying. You know, if you ever have a privilege of listening to that message he preaches, it will tear at your soul about the power of prayer. But what a book. But if we are going to impact this community, we're going to need faithfulness to God, not haphazardness. We're going to need God consistently working in us in adoration, confession, restitution, thankfulness, forgiveness, and unity. We're going to need to be unified in the faith. It's not going to be, hey, we're going to show up a certain amount of time and pray. No, no, no. It's going to be consistent. We need to come and pray. We need to pray. And you know what he says? Many people said, oh, I can pray from the house. It's something about coming to God's house and getting in a pew, getting on the altar and praying. He says it takes us away from our comfort zone. And it shows our commitment to God and the desire to be heard of God. He goes, after a while, he goes, everybody I knew had a key to the building. People are like, he said, well, that was stupid. He goes, why? Why would you rob from God if you want to hear from God? He goes, people just came. He goes, they knew my office pretty much was off limits at times. But he said, they didn't come to talk to me. They didn't come to fellowship. They came to pray and they left. They prayed and they left. And he goes, all hours of the night, people were in the sanctuary. All hours of the day. Businessmen in their lunch break, instead of going to a dinner, they came here to pray. And he goes, God grew our church exponentially through salvation, through power, through restoration. And you think about this, what will it take? He goes, it proved that people, when they're willing to go beyond what's normal, God will meet them in the abnormal. And he said, you know what? My church is made of so many nationalities. And he goes, God is supreme. God's people don't care about where we come from. God's people care about where we're going. And when God's people have prejudice, there's a problem here. When God's people are always focused on ourselves and we're always wondering if someone's doing this or someone's doing that, then our focus is on us and not Him. Amen. Unity until we all come in the unity of the faith. And that is the next thing. We have to have faith God's going to answer, D.L. Moody says. Amen. But the final thing he says, none of this will matter if there's no submission. If we're not going to submit to what God would have us do, then there's a problem. Jim Simula said that it was a powerful thing to watch the submission of people to come out and go to the dirtiest of homeless person and say, Jesus loves you. He goes, I saw people, businessmen from Fifth Avenue, from Wall Street, sitting on a dirty curb in their suits with their New Testament next to a guy that hasn't had a bath in months. They're about to go back to Wall Street and I'm sure they'll have a stench on them. They didn't care. There was a soul 
the need of the Lord. And he said, you know what? God honored that. Ian Bounds says, prayer can do anything that God can do. James 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. J. Baxter stained his steady walls with tears and his praying breath. Hundreds were swept into the kingdom. David Brainerd ministered alone among the Indians. His whole life was a life of prevailing prayer. He prayed day and night, before and after preaching, riding on his horse and on a bed of straw, hour by hour, day by day, week by week. Sadly, he died of pneumonia in his 30s. Gave his life to the North American Indians when there was hardly anyone that ever reached the savage. He said, you know what? There's only one person containing the savageness of my heart, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing how people look at others and say, oh, they're weird, they're different, they're this. Yeah, they may look different, but we're all savages at heart. Without God, look what sin does to the world. That's why Paul said, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. What was Paul? Paul was a murderer. He was a savage. Rounding up, he said he pulled the families out of the homes and dragged them away. What evil person would do that? Paul says, me. But you know what he says? Let me tell you about the greatest day of my life. I'm just riding to go persecute more Christians on the way to Damascus, and bam! God got a hold of my, arrested me. And I became a child of God. God made him a murderer. Excuse me, God converted him from being a murderer to a missionary. But Paul says, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. But finally this, this afternoon, and this won't be it because there's a lot I want you to see on this, but effectively. How do we pray effectively? There's not a man walking with God who is not interested in having an effectual prayer. Truly, I, I don't believe there's not a Christian that does not say, I would like to have a prayer life that's that good. But the problem is not what we would like. It's how committed we will be. It's like losing weight. It's like exercising. There are days I look at the treadmill and go, Ugh. but I know I have to do it. And other days I'll get busy. But here's the thing. If I am ever going to see consistent in keeping my health well, I'm going to have to exercise. It's not just going to come because I think about it and grab another cookie. No, there's no weight loss cookies, I promise you. If there are, you wouldn't want to eat them. <laughs> Maybe brand cookies or something, you know, with no sugar, no chicken. But the thing is, people say, well, I can't do it. You're right. With an attitude like that, we can't. Well, I can never learn to pray like that. Who says you can? Ian Bounds. Talks about it all begins in the battle of the mind. How bad do you want to see souls saved? How bad do you want to see your life walking with the Lord? How bad? Then we'll do it. I've seen a lot of people do a lot of things. Do you think about one, a true Canadian hero? Terry Fox. People told me he wouldn't be able to do it. He said, well, I'll run as long as I can. He never finished the race, but he started it. Yeah. Think about, you, you can't do it. You're an amputee. You got cancer. You could never run across Canada. He started. He started. And he made a good way before cancer took him. But you know, one people say, go for you, Terry. That's great. And what, 40 years later, they're still running for him? A young man in the prime of his life was taken. 
but not before he did something about it. If we are going to be a Terry Fox in the spiritual world, we got to start running. And you know what? The nation got behind him. I was just a kid. But the nation got behind him and his cause because he was valiant and he started. He started with nothing. His dad, his family says, we'll get a car and rent a trailer and we'll, we'll drive beside you. Next thing you know what? By the time he made it out of certain provinces, he was fully sponsored. He didn't have a penny to his name. But he knew what cancer was doing to his life and he didn't want it to happen to anybody else. Folks, we know what sin is doing to people's lives. And we ought to be valiant enough to say, I'm going to start this year. And I don't care what happens. I'm going to plan a time. I'm going to prepare for that time. I'm going to prevail in that time. And I'm going to pray effectively that I will prevail because this community needs the Lord. This church needs to grow. This church needs the power of God. This church needs this. There's a lot of things we need. But we can only get it from God. To this end, one important means to a development of effectual prayer life would be to look and to study the lives and the prayers of those who have seen miraculous answers to prayer, such as Hezekiah. Think about Hezekiah. Rabbishak stood and cried with a loud voice and says, You guys are going to fall. Don't listen to Hezekiah, he's a loser. He's this and he's that. Although Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18, 28 and 31, read that passage today. Hezekiah was troubled. He told his soldiers not to listen to the guy. But instead of defending himself, when Hezekiah heard that Assyrians were outside the walls, he rent his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth and ashes, and went to the house of the Lord. In 2 Kings 19, Isaiah the prophet encouraged him and says, Thou, thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The Lord told Hezekiah, don't worry about him. I'm going to send a rumor. Sure enough, they sounded like horsemen were coming from Egypt. They're Babylon. They got all nervous. They went home. And the king was killed by his own son in the temple. God took care of his people. But Hezekiah didn't run and say, hey, children of Israel, we're in trouble now. Now, now I just want you to get... No, no. He says, I'm going to go straight to God. Notice the element of effectual righteous prayer. When Hezekiah received a threatening letter from the king of Assyria, he immediately, immediately, the Bible says, spread the letter before the Lord in the temple. There was no thought of calling a committee. His first thought was take it to the matter to the God of heaven and cast it at his feet. Sometimes we want to bemoan all that God said. Talk to him. Don't tell me. Don't tell your family. Don't tell him. Talk to God. He's, I'm not allowing you to go through this. I don't even know what you're going through. You're not allowing me, you know, I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. God allowed that. Take it to him. He's the orchestrator of the plans for our life. And talk to him. There are always important issues that demand our time and attention. So it's vitally important that we learn how to pray, pray effectively. Next week, Lord willing, I will look at some methods to pray effectively. That we can pray that when we step from our knees, we will step with confidence. That our day is in God's hands. Plan a prayer time this week. Prepare for a prayer time. Prevail in a prayer time. And listen, most of you in this church have a key to this church. You're not affecting my wife at all if you come in the sanctuary. The heater's right there. Turn it up. I don't care how much it costs. Get on your knees and pray. Get, sit in your chair. 
This church is our church. This is God's sanctuary. Let's see what God can do. If God allows us to have an effort, if God gives us the ability and gives us the strength to have an effort to go out of our comfort zone, to spend some fuel, to spend this and that, to come pray, you think God's going to honor that when we follow through and do it? Absolutely. Think about driving down to Brooklyn from all areas of New York. Downtown Brooklyn. Google where that church is. It's not a convenient place to get to. And 24 hours a day, there are people in that church. If you have a chance to read the book, it's been out for many, many years. But it will encourage you. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Listen to his sermon about his daughter coming back to God. It will touch your heart. But he talks about prayer and the power of it. God cares about our needs. God cares about our kids. God cares about our community. And God will change our heart and change our desire from earthly to heavenly. May God help us as we step from our knees, as we learn to walk as God would have us to walk. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power that you have promised us that the privilege that we have through prayer. Use this message to challenge us, to help us to be committed to you in all things. May we give our lives and hearts to you in ways that we've never imagined. Lord, I ask you that you would just continue to lead, guide, and direct in our hearts. Lord, would you stir up those of us that are here, those of us that may hear this online later, that we would begin to develop a habit, a desire, a prayer, as Daniel did three times a day. Lord, may we fill this church with praying souls that we could see God do a mighty work. Lord, we need laborers. Lord, we would love to have an assistant pastor and a song leader. Lord, we'd love to have kids filling up the Sunday school rooms. Lord, we ask you that you would just provide that through the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man and woman of this church. May we see more missionaries added, more souls added, discipleship programs, Lord, things that only you could bring. No amount of door knocking, no amount of missions, no amount of things will ever replace the power of a sold out Christian's prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your wooing and beseeching us to fall upon our knees. Lord, help us to read these chapters this week, books on these great people, and ask ourselves, Lord, what's hindered me from being that person? What's hindered me from being sold out in that way? Thank you, Lord, for continuing to love us and lay the messages upon our hearts to show us what our desires should be and how they should align with you. Dismiss it with your blessing. Bring us back on Wednesday night again as we study the book of Mark. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. May the Lord bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Have a great afternoon.